Good evening. Good evening. I am very excited to be here tonight. Uh, I have a purpose and a call to be here tonight. I'll explain that in a little bit. <laughs> um, first, pastor's in big trouble for calling me Barbie. So I'll have to get in my Southern Missouri draw and tell you, clarify, I am not no Barbie. I may look like one, but I am not one. <laughs> Uh, I come from Liberal, Missouri. It's near Lamar or Joplin, um, kind of in the southwest corner of Missouri. And uh, small town population, 700 and I think 68. We've grown since I uh, went to high school there, 701 back then. Um, and uh, so I'm just a country girl. We had cows, horses. I showed cattle, showed horses. You know, got on my four-wheeler, got dirty. I have all guys in the family. I have a brother and boy cousins, and I was the only girl. So I am as far from Barbie as you could get. Really. You know, I can doll all up, yes. But uh, as far as who I am um, and and what I, you know, want to be and accomplish is, is definitely far from Barbie. So I'm going to pick on him some more for saying that. But anyway, we'll move on. We'll get past that. Um, I am so excited to be here tonight. I tell you, you are here for a purpose tonight. You are absolutely here for a purpose tonight. It's not because I'm here. It's because God's here. God has an assignment here tonight. And he has tried so hard to keep me from this place. <laughs> um, this nice little finger here, uh, you can't see it really up close, but... Um, Monday, I was going out a door so fast um, that I caught my ring on the door, which threw me up against the brick wall and hung me on the door like this and about broke my finger and I was in a little splint thing for a few days. And uh, I said, okay, God, you know, I want to be here tonight and everything's tried to come against me to be here. And that was about the last thing. And I said, no, I am not letting him win. And sometimes we have to, when we've done all to stand, we keep on standing, therefore. So God has an assignment here tonight. He has a purpose for you. And I am just going to yield to him tonight and let him have his way. So let's just open in, in prayer tonight. Father, I thank you for this service. I thank you for every single person that is here. I thank you for the opportunity that you have given me. I, I uh, bless Pastor Larry and, and Miss Loretta and thank you for their call, uh, for their purpose and for this church that they have established here. Father, I pray blessings over their lives, over their ministry. Father, I thank you for the, tonight the word that is going to come forth. Father, Holy Spirit, I yield to you, sir. I ask you to have your way in this service tonight. Let my hands be your hands, my feet be your feet, my voice be your voice. Minister to the people tonight the word that you want declared forth and put a watch before my mouth. I will say those things that you want spoken tonight and that only, Father. And we give you this service and ask you to have your way in Jesus' name. Um, I uh, am a pharmacist. And pardon me for the water, but I'm going to share a little bit about my testimony, but I kind of have to keep drinking water, and it's not because I'm nervous, because I've done this so many times. People say, do you still get nervous? And I said, you know, weirdly enough, no, because I have spoken in front of so many people and so many huge crowds that God's just given me an ability to do that, and it didn't come at first. So let me tell you, young people, I used to get up here and just... But it's the power of the Holy Ghost that you are able to overcome all things. So you yield to him, pray in the Holy Ghost, ask him for strength, ask him for courage. You can do everything that God has put in your heart to do. Don't ever give up. I love to preach to young people too. Um, but I am a pharmacist and I, my dad was a pharmacist. Uh, I grew up in a pharmacy and a small town again where we knew everybody. I love people. I love to greet people. I'm just a small town girl that loved to play basketball and loved to sing. And why I'm even Miss Missouri, I have no idea. I'm telling you the truth. It was 1990, actually Miss Missouri for the Miss USA program. I sing, and my mom uh, actually bribed me to be in it. She told me that if I would enter the competition, that she would buy me the prom gown I wanted. So I said, sure. Um, so I entered my first teen 
pageant and won, and there was a Miss Missouri that was a judge and said, you've got to do this. And for me, it was just stage experience. I've been singing since I was this tall. My parents also had a gospel group called the Beacons, and we traveled the four states. Nothing nothing big and major, but I grew up in the church and spirit-filled churches, and I just, I loved it. I knew it was in my heart, and I knew it was what God had called me to do. And so, you know, you just you just go through life. You just you seek God, you, you go after God with all your heart and you do today what you can do today. We don't, we don't, we sometimes try to jump ahead of ourselves, but just do today what God is wanting you to do today. And today God needed me here. Despite what Satan was trying to prevent, God needed me here. And so regardless of all the things that happened, I could tell you that my staff pharmacist went on maternity leave a week and a half ago, my um, operations manager of, I own a pharmacy also, and my operations manager of 20 years left at the exact same time that my lead pharmacist left. I'm already short-staffed because one of my um, employees decided to go back to nursing school. I was like, yes, praise God. So I'm really down three people. So I've been trying to be three people this last two weeks, right when I know God has called me out to do what he wants me to do. And you just go, ah! But I said, okay, God, give me the strength today to do what I need to do today. Even though I know I want to be out preaching and ministering today, I had to be the office assistant, the IT person, my register. That's why I was hurt my finger. My register went down and I needed a different cord. And I was like, I'll run to the store and get the cord. And I'm running out the door and hang myself on the door. And if I would have just slowed down. But anyway. God has a call and a purpose, and don't forget that, and I want you to seek him and just do today what you can do today, okay? I have, um, my husband is a teacher and a coach in Nevada, Missouri, on 54 Highway, so it's just, we just buzz right up 54 to get here, and he's a head basketball coach. My daughters, I have an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old teenager, and uh, they're wonderful women of God. We have raised them in the church talking in the spirit since they were about five or six years old. They've been raised in the word, and I'll tell you, it makes a difference. Um, I accepted Jesus Christ when I was about eight years old. I, I did grow up in the church, and then 16, I, I asked the uh, Holy Ghost, full baptism of the Holy Ghost, and speaking with tongues and doing all that good stuff, and the word came alive. I found out who I was in Christ and his call and his purpose for my life, and my girls are... I know have a call, and and God is going to lead them in the direction they're supposed to go. Um, my 16 year old, I know we mis- mentioned, she's Miss Missouri, America's U.S. Teen, and she'll be competing in uh, July for America's U.S. Teen. Um, and to tell the truth, I didn't want her to be in pageants at all because I haven't been in them. I mean, it was a one time thing. Like I said, I did it, well, not one time. I did a teen pageant, and then I was 18 years old when I entered the Miss Missouri competition. And I won. And the five, the four runners up were back from the year before. So I didn't think I had a chance. But God had a plan. And I remember when I got in the top ten, I went in the corner and I said, Okay, God, if you can use this in any way for you, go right ahead. But otherwise, I don't want to do this. And what did he do? He had me win. And after, I'm not kidding, after it was over, it was down in Branson that year. And after it was over, I went back to, I'm still going to say SMS, Missouri State. I still have the worst time saying that. I went back to my dorm room as a freshman and bawled my eyes out. I went, you know where they say that part? If there's no way she can fulfill her duties, they'll give it to the first runner-up. I'm going, give it to the first runner-up. I don't know what I'm doing. I seriously hadn't had any modeling classes, nothing. I just had been on stage since I was a kid. So, you know, God had a purpose and a plan. Um, I went on to pharmacy school and got married, married the love of my life. He, I met him when I was 16 years old. We were high school sweethearts. And next year, we will celebrate our 25th anniversary. So love him. I wish they could have been here tonight. But um, again, he's a teacher and then a coach, so they had practice tonight. So I don't think the coach would have been too happy if I would made him come. But anyway, <laughs> big game tomorrow night. Um, but... I just, I don't, I get up here and I know people say, oh, she's a former Miss Missouri. I am as normal 
as normal can be like the rest of you. So take all that junk off, you know, the makeup. I haven't wore this much makeup in a long time, okay? I'm telling you. So he said they have lights and cameras, and I went, okay, we'll go back to the old stage makeup. But anyway, my daughter, she, um, my youngest one, my oldest is actually going to be valedictorian of her class, and there's about 212. She's a very, very smart girl, very athletic. And then um, Chloe, she's uh, going to be 16 in a few weeks, and she decided she wanted to enter a pageant. And I went, oh, please. And I said, go get Grandma. <laughs> So she went and got grandma and she entered her first one and, and got fourth runner up. And then um, she said, you know, mom, I really think this is what God's calling me to do. And so she has been working at it, has been working on her interviewing skills and talking to people and working on how she should walk. And she went and won um, this pageant in October. And so whatever God has planned, I'm going to have to get an agreement. <laughs> And, and possibly, possibly get back, back into the, the that, 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 that pageant, pageant world. world. But God puts us in places because he has a reason and he has a purpose for you in that place. And sometimes we get so caught up that we want to be the missionary and the pastor and everybody wants this position when God has you right where he needs you to be. And my husband, I have tried to make him everything else. <laughs> I have wanted him to be, I'm just telling you, when I was young and in ministry, I wanted him to be Dave Meyer. So bad, you know. Then I wanted him to be, you know, whether it be uh, Kenneth Copeland, whoever. I'm just saying I wanted him to be a minister with me, and I was trying to make him, you know, get up there and talk with me and go to youth groups and get, have him get up and talk. And, you know, I finally figured out he's not very happy, and it's not what he likes to do. So, Lori, quit trying to make him something he's not. He is a called teacher. He loves kids. He is the biggest encourager. Uh, prays with them if they want him to. He encourages the kids. He's a basketball coach. He's had more influence on those kids all through that years. He is right where God wants him to be. And he's happy and fulfilled. So we need to seek God. Where does he want us to be? Seek him. Find his purpose for you. You are called. Larry was just, Pastor Larry was just saying, we are called with a purpose, it says in that Romans 8, 28. Called for his purpose. Find what his purpose is and pursue it with all your heart. Yeah, we get distracted. Yeah, we go through stuff. But just keep on fighting the good fight of faith. I want to take you to um, 1 Peter. Excuse me. And actually, Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. Because I want you to know, and I know you, you, you are in this church, you're under Pastor Larry and, and this church here. I know you've been taught the Word. I know you've been taught the Word. Um, I just want to encourage you in that today. First, uh, Second Peter chapter one verse two. I'm going to read it in the Amplified. May God, may grace, God's favor and peace, which is perfect well-being, all necessary good, all spiritual prosperity and freedom from fear and agitating passion and moral conflicts, be multiplied to you in the full, personal, precise, and correct knowledge of God, of Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace and peace be multiplied to you, it says in the King James, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Word. He's our Savior. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word came and dwelt among us. The Word is flesh. Jesus is the Word. It says grace and peace is multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. The more you know of Him, the more grace, the more peace that is multiplied to you. That's why we need to know the Word. It gives you the grace, the operational power, the full ability of God to do what you're called to do, and the peace that you definitely need to go right along with it to accomplish His purpose. In verse 3, it says, For His divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are requisite and suited to life, godliness through the full personal knowledge, full personal knowledge of Him who has called us 
by and to his own glory and excellent virtue. By means of these, he has bestowed upon us his precious and exceedingly great promises so that through them you might escape the moral decay, corruption that is in the world because of covet covetousness and become sharers and partakers of his divine nature. Praise God, he has bestowed upon us his precious, great exceeding promises. That is the word of God to you that is real, that is alive, that is oper operative. Operative, think about that, operative. It says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is powerful. It's alive. It penetrates. It's operative. What do you do when you operate? You go in, you cut something open, and you fix it. That's what the Word of God does. It has operational power. It's alive. It goes into you, and it changes the things that need to be changed. It makes you more like God. It brings you grace and peace. Um, then in verse 13, this is why I'm here. I think it is right, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by way of remembrance tonight. I know you know the word. I know if you go to church here, you have to know the word of God. But I am here tonight to stir you up in remembrance of what God has said about you. His word, there are three things. His word has been given to us. God has given to us his divine, God-like power and ability to deal with anything that comes your way. He said, I have bestowed upon you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Did it say just a few things? What did it say? All things God has bestowed upon you. Everything you're going to need for life and godliness, He has provided and bestowed upon you. You have what you need in this Word, but it's up to you to do something with it. So God has already given us His godlike power and ability. Two, it's up to us to know, it said, the full knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. It's up to us to know what our God will do in every situation. If you don't know what you, your God will do for you, you're going to flounder around in hope and, and, I mean, disappointment, despair. But if you know what your God will do, it doesn't matter what the devil brings. You know you have a way out. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, no temptation or trial that comes your way, you know, is going to overtake you. It says, but God is faithful to always provide a way out, a means of escape to a landing place. There's a place of peace. When you're in the midst of tribulation and trial and you do not know what you're going to do, your God is faithful. Faithful to his word, faithful to his promises to provide a way of escape to a landing place. Think about it when you fly. You're up in that. Maybe there's some of you that don't like flying, like my husband. It's not so much he doesn't like flying, he gets motion sickness. So he kind of just has to take some of that Dramamine. And he's up there in that plane and it's going like this. And he's, oh God, get me through. And you know, he can't wait till we land. And when those wheels hit the ground, you go, <sighs> because sometimes on that plane, you hit, you hit turbulence, don't you? And I mean, that planes are rocking and a moving. And I was sharing with uh, Phil, wherever he is, he's, I think maybe somewhere back. I was sharing with him through the Miss USA pageant. I got to be on a, a USO tour, which they go at the Bob Hope USO tour. Bob Hope didn't get to go the year I went. He actually had um, was not feeling well, and they sent some other person. But I got to go to the Philippines and Guam and Okinawa and Japan and Alaska. And we they took us and we flew military the whole time. They took us in helicopters. We went right into where some of the military guys are in the jungle. And they haven't seen anybody for six months. <laughs> and in comes all these Miss USA girls. I'm telling you, the most polite gentleman I have ever met in my life. Absolutely. You know, really, to be honest, I thought, oh my goodness, these men have not seen women in six months. 
the, the most wonderful gentleman. And, and every time I, if I know you're a military person, I'm going to tell you, thank you for serving. And right now, any of you out there that have served our country, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for serving. We should be more appreciative of what our military you know, has done for us. They've given up their lives, sacrificed their lives so that we can live free and preach. The, a woman can get up on a stage and preach the gospel. Because we know there's places that does not happen. They are crucified. They are martyred for doing and preaching the gospel. I praise God for this country that I can do that. But we have got to know what God will do in those situations. We have got to know what our God will do. I was back on the, I know where I was, but the plane in the military. They flew us in. We were going from, I think, Philippines to Guam, if I'm right. And... It was in the summer, and there was a typhoon-like storm coming in. And they're trying to avoid it. They're trying to fly around it. And we hit the worst turbulence of your life. Now, I'm not in this nice little airplane seat. I am on a hammock strapped to the side of a plane. They have cargo in these planes. They had a Jeep in that plane. Yes. And I have this red hammock, and I'm just, I mean, I'm leaning up against the wall. It's bouncing everywhere. The girls are literally crying. But you know what held me? My faith, my hope in God. I had a peace that only he could have brung, and I had peace in that thing. And I just kept telling him, God's going to take care of us. God is going to take care of us. What I wanted to say was, my angels are all around me, round about me, and camped all around me, and this plane's not going to go down because I'm in here. If you know your authority and you know who you are, with long life will he satisfy me and show me his, my salvation. I mean, you've got to know. See, in that moment, I knew what my God would do. I knew what my God would do. And then the third thing is, so if anything in your life... Anything in your life that comes at you can be changed by the knowledge of who God is in His Word. It can be changed. Let me tell you, the last probably, I guess I have to say six years of my life now, have been some of the most difficult years of my life. My mother and my daughter were in a head-on collision on a two-lane highway in Missouri, I get a phone call from my 12-year-old daughter that says, Mom, we've been in a horrible accident. And I said, are you okay? She said, my stomach hurts so bad. She goes, it's on fire. And I said, what about Grandma? And she said, now this is, you have to know my red-headed mother. She's, <laughs> she's in the car going, get me! <laughs> and but my mother had literally broke every bone in her body and my daughter I said what was really neat was when I got that phone call a woman got on the phone and I said you know she said your daughter's here she's with me we don't know the head of the situation but I'm here and she knew that she had called the pharmacy, that I worked at a pharmacy. The strangest thing is, is the woman was a drug rep from Springfield, and Nevada is in her area, and she knew who I was. Now, she'd just come in and out. I really didn't have a, most of them I kind of get a relationship with, but she said, you're the tall blonde in the pharmacy. And I said, yes. And she goes, don't worry, I'm with your daughter. And... I'm telling you, a gift of faith came over me. I said, Michaela, when she said, Mom, we've been in a bad accident. And I said, how's Grandma? I said, how are the other people? She goes, I don't know. All I hear is moaning. I said, listen to me, Michaela. You will live and you will not die. And you will declare the works of the Lord. I started speaking into her the word that I knew she needed to hear. And I immediately, I said, don't you worry, we'll be there. And I hang up. Of course, I call my husband. But the next thing I did was I called my best friend, my prayer partner. And I said, I know where my mother and daughter are going. 
I know my God's going to take care of them. Regardless, I know where they're going, but I have no idea if those other people in that car are saved. And Father, do not let them die without knowing Christ. We Im- I'm serious. I'm not making this up. I immediately started praying at my friend and I for, because I already knew what the Word said about my family. And I was okay. I was at peace. I was more concerned about the other people in that car. And we started praying for their salvation. And we got there. My mom was in ICU for a month. And my daughter was had um, lacerated her spleen and tore her abdominal wall from her midline clear over to the right. And she had a lot of physical therapy and things that we had to do. But I can't tell you how many things that God did to spare and to protect my family and what the devil meant to destroy me, to destroy my family, to take my mother and my daughter out. The angels were right there. And the story, the neat part of that story to tell you is, is the night before, we would go up and pray with my, my girls every night. And we always prayed, pled the blood of Jesus over them and prayed over their safety and we got done praying, and she, we left the room, and she said, Mom, will you come back in? And I said, sure. She goes, can we pray over the bus? Because I was just pleading the blood of Jesus over them, and their angels round about them, take charge of them, keep them in all their ways. And I said, well, sure, we can pray over the bus. Because she was going on a, on a trip, band trip. And my mother was picking them up and bringing her home after the band trip. And I said, sure, we'll pray over the bus. So we pled the blood of Jesus over the bus and, and um, over Grandma and um, I said, no problem. But she had this sense and this uneasiness and wanted me to even cover it even more. And my mother has a big SUV, but for her 40th anniversary, my dad had got her a Mustang convertible because she had one when she first got in college and she'd never had one since. So she called my husband and said, can I take the Mustang? Do you care if Michaela goes in the Mustang? And he said, you know, I don't care as long as she sits in the back seat. She's 12. She was a big kid. But he said, I just want her to sit in the back seat. So we get down to, mom gets down there to Springfield to the band competition. And she picks up Michaela and my mom who wants to spoil them and do everything for them and get them ice cream and everything that I might not want them to have. So she says to Michaela, ah, why don't you ride in the front seat with me so we can talk? And my daughter says, no. My daddy told me to sit in the back seat. She sat in the back seat, put her seatbelt on, and they hit head on. And if Michaela had been sitting in the front seat, she would not be here. It completely crushed in the whole passenger side onto my mother. And they had to pull the jaws or whatever to get my mother out. That's why her whole entire right side was completely broken. The arm, the ribs, the femur, the I mean, just broke her all the way down. Her ankle, her tibia, fibula, it broke everything. But if my daughter would have been sitting there, she wouldn't have been here. Now, would it be that she... This is where you have to look at this. Would it be that my you know daughter had, had sinned or whatever? No. Sometimes... You know, things happen, we just aren't listening. We aren't in tune with the Spirit. That's why it's so important. I know people get mad and blame God for certain things that happen in their life. We just got to be in tune with God. We've got to be in tune with God. And we're going to miss it, and it's okay. Don't beat yourself up. We miss it. It's okay, but God is so merciful. He's so merciful. You know, there was times I think, why didn't Brent just say, Mom, drive the SUV? You know, but hey, he spared their life. Their, my mother, all she wanted to do is be able to ride her horse again, and she's riding her horse again. All is well. God is good. He's faithful. Then this same daughter that was in that wreck ended up loves basketball. Freshman year, star basketball player. Averaging 20 points a game. District, she started as a freshman. District championship. We're right in the running with them. And in the second quarter, she goes down and tears her ACL. We get, we we immediately are speaking faith over it. She goes in and has whatever needed to be done. They told us six months she'd be back. 
six months, nine months, still not working right. Something's just not right. I can't get them to listen to me. And I finally said, we are doing another MRI. There is something not right. And we go in about almost nine to ten months later to another MRI, and it never reattached or vas... I'm getting into my detail, but it didn't revascularize on the femoral side, which is the top side where it should have, they should have attached it here. It like didn't get tissue, didn't get blood supply and life to it, so it didn't adhere. So we had to go through another ACL surgery. We ha she had to be off another year. I can't tell her why. I can't explain. You know, you got a teenager that, and I said, all I can tell you is that God gives you double for your former shame. He takes the ruins in Isaiah 58. He rebuilds the ruins. He'll make your line sh light shine as the noonday. Michaela, God is going to take care of you. We just keep speaking the word. Things happen. And I'll tell you what I've learned from everything is I started in this walk of faith. And I'll tell you, I, I, I did. I got into, I love the word. I love the spirit. And if I, man, if I just prayed enough and confessed enough scripture and did everything just perfect, everything was going to be great. But what does John 16, 33 tell us? Let's go there real quick. And they may, they may put it up for me. John 16, 33 says, I have told you all those, these things so that in me, you may have perfect peace and confidence in this world. You'll have tribulation, trials, distress, frustration, be of good cheer, take courage, be confident for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of its power to harm you and I have conquered it for you. Stuff is going to happen. And it's not that you missed God, that you weren't serving him, that you were in sin. I mean, I've been in that. Go down my checklist. Go, where did I miss it? Where did I miss it with you? God, I'm so sorry. What did I do? You know what I was doing? I was serving God. I was loving God. I was doing everything I could with my whole heart that I love him. But we have an adversary who is seeking whom he may devour. And those of us that are doing the things of God, he wants to stop you in your tracks. He doesn't want you to be fulfilling the call of God. He doesn't want you to be fulfilling that purpose. But don't let that scare you. He's overcome the world. He's given you his word. He's given you that knowledge that you know what your God is doing. You can change any situation with that word. My daughter's now a senior playing ball, doing amazing. But maybe through that, she realized basketball isn't everything. Their daddy being a basketball coach and her mama playing basketball. It kind of was her world. But you know what? She's a smart cookie. And she can sing like you wouldn't believe. God has a purpose. Then, about 18 months ago, I just get through all that, get my daughters, get everything going. I feel like, whew, I'm going to breathe here for a second. And I got struck with an illness. Um, I got, I, I, I don't like to say this because I don't want to put any fear in anybody, but I, I got bit by a tick, which I've been bit by ticks my entire life. There's a lot of, of things that went into it. Most people, if that happens, take an antibiotic, no problem. But... After, After my, my six, six weeks antibiotics, antibiotics, I was feeling better. And in December of 2013, I started. So I, to me, it's done, over. God took care of it. Move on. I started tremoring, shaking. I had facial paralysis. I couldn't remember why I was walking into a room. I didn't know what I was doing. I started to have this brain fog, muscle fatigue. Every joint was aching. And then they retested and I had Borreliosis, which is a form of Lyme disease. And I had to put a port in and I had to be on antibiotics for 12 weeks. Couldn't work, sitting at home in the recliner. Couldn't hardly lift my hand to feed myself. But I'm sitting there knowing, my God is faithful. He's faithful to his word. 
By his stripes, I am healed. My God will strengthen, sustain, and refresh me in this bed of languish, languish, and he will turn, tra- transform, and change me in this illness. That's Proverbs 18, 14. It came to destroy me. And do you want to know how many people have come up to me and say, Oh my goodness, I know someone who's had that 15 years and they never get over it. They're debilitated. They can't do anything. I heard story after story after story. You know, because people are, are just trying to communicate with you and try to make it as, as if they understand. But you can't let those words enter your heart. You have to refuse to listen to that. It says that we're supposed to guide our guard, our eyes, our heart. It tells us in Matthew, those things. Teenagers, guard your heart, guard your eyes, guard your ears. You're going to hear a lot of stuff. You're going to be exposed to a lot of stuff, but you don't have to let it in and change you. So, you know, people and their well-meaning said all those things, but I immediately, I will tell you, even though I couldn't move, I couldn't hardly do anything, I couldn't even work, I was stuck in this chair, I said, my God is my healer. The same spirit that lived in, that was in Jesus Christ dwells on the inside of me. Romans, you know, uh, is 8, 11, 11, 8. I'm having a little moment here. Um, I've said it so many times, you would think I would know in 811. Yep. Um, the spirit of him who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of me, right? And it says that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead gives to life my mortal, short-lived, I love it in the Amplified, perishable body through his spirit who dwells in you. Let me read it here in, in mine. If the spirit of him who raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead will also restore to life your mortal, short-lived, perishable body through his spirit who dwells on the inside of you. God's spirit dwells on the inside of me. Lyme is a name. Borreliosis, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, everything they diagnosed me, it is a name. A name that is subject to the name of Jesus Christ. There's no greater name than the name of Jesus. It's just a name that has to bow its knee to the name of Jesus. I put a whole confession sheet together and said the same spirit that dwells on the inside of me is bigger and raised Jesus Christ. It will raise me out of this bed of illness. It will not keep me down. Now I'm telling you it wasn't easy. It's been, it's been 18 months and I'm just now starting to feel normal. I had to fight. I couldn't give up. And I'm telling you there were times I wanted to give up. I can't take this anymore. I hurt so bad. I would literally, my muscles and joints would hurt so bad, I would lay in the floor and roll. It's the only thing that felt good. I would lay there and roll with tears rolling down my eyes. Saying, I just can't take this anymore. But then God would send a word, a friend, a song, to pick me up out of that, to, to, to remember, go, go to Proverbs 18, 14. Um, the strong spirit of a man will sustain him in his bodily pain or trouble but a weak and broken spirit, who can raise up or bear? Um, I think it's in the... Um, um, oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. It's Psalms 41. I like that one, too. I said that one all the time, too. Proverbs 18, 14, I did say all the time. The strong spirit of a man sustains him in his bodily pain and trouble, but a weak and broken spirit, who can raise? It's, pro- it's Psalms 41. Let's go there. Psalms 41.3, the Lord will sustain, refresh, and strengthen him on his bed of languish. All his bed, O Lord, you will turn, change, and transform in in this illness. 
And it says, you, O Lord, in verse 10, will be merciful and gracious to me and raise me up. Just as he raised Christ up, that spirit that's on the inside of you, he will raise you up. Now, yeah, I wanted it instant. I wanted to say that scripture a few times and it'd be better and all gone and done and over with. But God changed me where I was. He changed some things in me. He did a work in me while I sat in that chair. You know, I was going 100 mile an hour, not resting. Yeah, I was trying to eat right, but I was not resting. I was not taking care of me. Two teenage daughters owning a business, trying to be super woman. God didn't create us to be super women. He just created us to be godly women. I would read that Proverbs 31 woman and how... I can be that strong, that Proverbs 31 woman. How she sold her goods and she stayed up at night and prayed through the night. You know? And I was like, oh, I want to be that Proverbs 31 woman. But I'll tell you what. The Proverbs 31 woman, I believe, could discern what she needed to do and what she wasn't supposed to do. And I was just trying to be everything to everyone and I wasn't taking care of me. And I had allowed my immune system to tank. I was exposed to some mold and some lime. My immune system was so far down. I had no more strength. So when I actually did get bit and get, you know, the, those infections, I could not fight. So listen to your spirit. Say no. If you have to say no, say no. Sometimes we think, oh, but they've got to understand, especially in the church. This committee, that committee, you know, do this, do that, teach this, teach that. And then we, then we feel like, oh, well, I got to explain why I can't right now. And, and I hope they understand. If they don't understand, that's their problem. Your only allegiance is to God. Your only obedience is to him. And they're just going to have to handle it. So discern who you are. Discern your body. Since we're in Psalms, let's go to Psalms 57. I just, tonight, I want to give you hope. I want to, again, like I said in 2 Peter chapter 1, I am here tonight in this tabernacle to stir up your remembrance of the Word. To stir you up in what God has put in your heart. Don't give up. Psalms 57, 1, be merciful and gracious to me, O God. Be merciful and gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge. Find shelter and confidence in you. Yes, in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge and be confident until the calamity and the destruction, destructive storms are past. I will cry out to God Most High who performs on my behalf, who rewards me, who brings to pass His purposes for me, and He surely will complete them. It says in Philippians 1 that He's begun a good work in you. He will do it. He will do it. Right here it says He, he, will, he will bring to pass His purposes for you. He will surely complete them. There is no devil in hell. There is no principality, no power that can stop God's plan for your life. There is no person. I don't care where you've come out of. There is nothing that can stop God's purpose for your life except you. You're the only one that can stop it. If God has something planned, He's going to bring it to pass. And you may feel like, man, can't I get a lucky break? Maybe you were raised in a, in a, in a household that just, you, not one good break and you were abused and then you tried to go to school and, and, and then everything went wrong and you couldn't get an education and you ended up just, you know, working at a strip mall and, and, and then you get married and things just don't work out and you go, gosh, God, do you know I'm here? God knows you're here. He has a purpose for you. And there's none of that that can stop God's purpose and plan for your life. Nothing. Don't lose hope in who He is. Don't lose hope in His purpose for you. 
He will surely bring it to pass. You can rest in his mercy and his grace and your soul when all that torment and frustration and everything's coming against you. I was in a moment where I hurt so bad. I've been there and said, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be here anymore. I would rather be walking the streets of gold. Being with my Savior. Then down here with an IV stuck in my arm and pain that I can't control. I love my children. I love my husband. But just take me. I don't want to be here anymore. I know what that feels like. But God, who is faithful, turned, changed who I was in that moment. Had a friend stop at the door. Just come in. Grab me in her arms. I was home that night by myself. God sent someone. Took me under her wing and she just prayed for me. Listen to the Holy Ghost. Listen to Him. You know, you may just, just smiling at someone. Just saying hello. Just encourage, sending a card. Calling him on the phone. You don't know when God is using you at a pivotal point in their life. God uses all of us. Loretta and I were just talking like in this chess game of life. And, and we take one move this way, but God's moving someone this way and moving this way to bring you to that checkmate place. But each other piece has to move at its coordinated time. And sometimes you're stuck right there until you can find the right move. We don't like being stuck. I don't like being stuck. But sometimes we've got to wait till those pieces are just perfect. And maybe he needed to use that person over here so that you could go over here. But if that person isn't quite listening right now, we can't move. He He works works the whole game, the whole, all the pieces together. Your Your life life is a masterpiece. God has everything, everything planned out perfect down to the last little stroke of the brush. Your life is a masterpiece. He hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't given up on you. You're not too young. You're not too old. Whatever it is, I'm not good enough, not smart enough, not pretty enough, can't, don't have a talent. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You have a plan. You have a reason. God has a purpose for you. Seek Him. In the moment of your distress, in the moment of your calamity, cry out to your God. Take shelter. Let your soul take refuge and find shelter and confidence in your God. Let him be what you need him to be. He will show up every single time. He won't let you down. He won't give up on you. Don't give up on him. 